Nigel Farage is no political buddy of mine. Our views coincided over Brexit and we worked together and we won. And I will never resile from that or be in any way embarrassed about that. It was a truly epic victory led by him in a referendum that never would have happened other than as a result of his Herculean efforts, derided, reviled, but ultimately triumphant. But he's no political friend of mine. But I immediately leapt into the fray when it turned out that his bank had cancelled his bank account. And I know what that feels like. Not personally, because I have never had a day's problem with my bank, the Bank of Scotland, with whom I have banked for almost 40 years. But other people close to me and other organizations for which I've worked, other campaigns with whom I'm associated, have had untold politically motivated problems with banks. But never did I imagine that Nigel Farage, who is not a poor man, I'm sure about that, would be debanked, uh, as we now must describe it, debanked by the Queen's own bankers, Coots and Co., which is a very grand name and a grand old feature of British banking architecture, but was long ago taken over by the National Westminster Bank. Not so grand, not so historic. National Westminster was one of the banks that took Britain to the very edge of bankruptcy back in 2008. Too big to fail they were, so the state, the taxpayer, the public, had to take them over and bail them out. And the state still owns 40% of the National Westminster Bank, which owns Coots & Co, a royal subsidiary. Coots & Co took a decision. It now turns out on documents legally acquired by Farage, on the grounds that Farage did not represent their values, values, and was associated with people and things that contravened their ethics, ethics, banking, ethics, that he could no longer be a customer, even though he had plenty of money in the bank, even though his account had been administered by him absolutely properly and for many decades even though there was not a scintilla of wrongdoing on the part of Nigel Farage, they unceremoniously kicked him out of the bank, holding a check that he could go and find another bank to deposit his holdings in. Now, I don't know about you, but if a bank kicked me out, I'd assume that no other bank would be in a hurry to take me because on the principle that there's no smoke without fire, they would instantly conclude that Farage must have been up to no good. And that's precisely what the bank sought by subterfuge through its friends in the media, principally in the BBC, to imply or infer, certainly not to say, for that would be defamatory, wholly untrue as it was and as it is now proved to be. In fact, Farage has now obtained a 40-page dossier in which the bank's executives debate whether or not to debank one of the most famous people ever in the history of British politics. In the course of that 40-page dossier, they mentioned Russia 144 times, Trump 82 times, Brexit 62 times, and LGBTQ plus I issues 14 times. Apparently, Nigel Farage 
failed the test on all of those counts, even though he has nothing, nothing to do with Russia, has never had anything, anything to do with Russia. His opposition, very mild and meek, milk and water opposition to Joe Biden's war in Ukraine was enough to tip the balance. That and retweeting a joke by Ricky Gervais got Farage kicked out of the bank, saw him wandering the streets of London with his check looking for a bank that would allow him to bank it. Now, of course, his friends leapt to the defense of the bank initially, though not today that the document has seen the light. They said that turned out that Farage just wasn't rich enough to bank with Coots and Co. That was a lie. A lie repeated ad nauseum on the BBC and in The Guardian in particular. Both of them working out their animus towards Farage, not on anything to do with banking, everything to do with Farage and Brexit and their obsession, love affair with the European Union. The liars lied, but the truth, as always, in the end, will out. And Farage is lucky that it has won out already. He demanded a subject access report from the bank, and thus the 40-page dossier is now with him. And he's just promised in the last 15 minutes, there's more bad news for Coots and Co. and the National Westminster Bank and the banking community in general to be coming out tomorrow as a result of further whistleblowing and further investigation by Farage and people like me, like Andrew Neil, uh, the uh, right wing, famous former BBC journalist who's been playing a leading role in unmasking the truth behind this scandal. Now, why do I dwell upon all of this? Most of you in the world have never heard of Nigel Farage and have no particular interest in his banking travails. But here's why you should. You see, it's one thing if you own a restaurant taking the view that you'd rather not have Nigel Farage eating his way through a gourmet menu and choosing rather expertly, in my experience, from however an extensive wine list you may have. That arguably is your right. And Farage can go out and eat in another restaurant. But as even the British Prime Minister said today, banking was an essential service. Essential. In fact, it's legally protected in countries like Germany and France, where it is illegal to deny someone the right to open a bank account. And that's for very good reason. Because if you don't have a bank account, you might as well take a jump off the nearest bridge because you will not be able to work and live and pay bills in our 21st century society if you have no bank account. Moreover, people will conclude from the fact that you have no bank account that you must be a rum character indeed, to be shunned, certainly not to be employed, and not to be afforded any kind of credit, not to be allowed a mortgage, a loan, or any other kind of essential interaction that people have now in 2023. But here's the real importance. Rishi Sunak, who came to Farage's aid this afternoon, although Kutz and co. have still not backed down, even with the Prime Minister a billionaire against them on this. Rishi Sunak, the WEF 
the EU, the World Bank, the IMF are all headed firmly fast down the road towards the cashless society, the digital currency society. Can you imagine the power that would be given to the state and the banks if cash was no longer an option? If you could not buy a dinner in cash and had no bank card because the bank would not allow you to have a bank account, you would be up the creek without a paddle. And you might even starve to death. You would certainly struggle on a day-to-day -day basis with a level of social control exercised by the state and the private sector in a way that none of us could ever have dreamt of before except in the realms almost of science fiction. We have to stop this journey in its tracks. Don't abolish cash. Don't allow them to abolish cash. If you do, you're handing them the power to strangle you, not just control your life, which to an extent they already do, but to strangle your very means of life up to and including the point that you may very well expire.